Uh, now, we've got about half an hour for questions uh, for our panel, so um, if you could stick your hand up. There are roving mics, and um, Nick, do you want to join the panel as well? Or are you happy? You're staying? I oh, might just say something at the end. Okay, fine. All right, first question then. Yeah, I can see. Sorry, it's very bright, so if I don't recognize you, it's because I can't see. There's a lady over on the left-hand side there. Thank just you very much. Yeah. John, Long, John Cook, uh, Vice Chair, Lincolnshire yeah. Police Authority. Uh, we've heard today that uh, governance needs to remain stable through the transition. We've also heard that from Stephen Kershaw that authorities will be required to be involved in uh, training of the PCC candidates. Uh, there still remains the challenge on bureaucracy. Uh, Kit Malthouse has already said that letters, as they brought in, uh, went from 20 to uh, 30 and up to 300. Uh, and we've also heard that this is going to happen. I'm a pragmatist. This is going to happen, mm. all right? And it's going to bring a great deal of problems with it that need to be resolved. And a lot of those problems are going to have to be resolved at police authority level. So my question is, at a time when you need the expertise sat in police authorities, why on earth are you asking them to go through a major selection process for independent members at a time when you need those experts in place? Stephen, I don't know if that is that one for you. I, or? I think it, it probably is. Um, I, is this okay? You can hear me. Um, I, I'm struck by the, the sense you have that that's a major challenge going forward, and very happy to talk to you and colleagues about that. Uh, we tried quite hard in the light of representations from the APA on your behalf <coughs> to think about how we could make uh, some extensions in the. Uh, terms of office of sitting independence on police authorities um, precisely to avoid the, the, the necessity of uh, upheaval, as it were, in, in the last couple of years of a police authority's life. So if your sense is that we still haven't entirely cracked that, then of course we should talk about that some more. The bad news, I'm afraid, is that on uh, councillors, uh, because that has a much stronger statutory framework around it, we don't have the same discretion, I'm afraid, to simply roll people forward for a little bit longer. We have to go through the process every year of looking at the uh, electoral balance, as it were, in the light of that year's uh, local elections. But if there is more we can do on the independence on police authorities to minimise the friction that you're talking about, very happy to have that conversation. Okay. Dennis, what's going to happen about the inspection of police authorities as well? Is there any point in continuing with that process? for the next 18 months. I mean, there's a lot of effort and time and money goes into preparing for a police authority inspection. Well, I, I hope that the, uh, that the work we're going to do on the challenge and support visits is basically playing off the back of work you have to do anyway mm. to, to deal with the CSO. It, sh it really shouldn't be... That's the primary focus of this, and it shouldn't really depart greatly from that. When we look at the value for money provided by police forces, I am certain that we have to take account of your role. You authorities remain absolutely relevant. You're, you are actually in pilot mode or whatever you like for the next two years, and you've got to do quite a lot of the explanation to the public. So I think to not uh, you know, discuss with, with the authority that's sitting or the arrangements in London would be peculiar indeed, and I think it, it, it actually would undermine what we were trying to do because I think what we have to do is get a rounded view of what the changes are and what the implications are for the citizen. And we have to be assured, as Hugh said, that, that there's been a decent exchange around the implications of those plans in operational terms and in citizen service terms. Okay. So we, we, we will talk to authorities, of course we will. OK, thank you. Next lady there. Yep. Oh, sorry. Hello. Simon Afsar, Lancashire Police Authority. Uh, my question, really, I would have liked to ask the Minister this question, but I'll put it to the panel as well, and I don't think it's been touched on today in terms of uh, the equality and representation of women and underrepresented groups on this new governance structure. Um, and the Minister talked, and everybody has talked a lot about local accountability, but there is an assumption, uh, or does the panel feel there's an assumption, that everybody accesses um, their rights through the ballot box, and I certainly know a lot of groups don't. 
and how important does the panel see that there is also not just uh, in terms of uh, a voice at a low level but at that governance level how important is it that there should be women underrepresented groups and and if they do see it as important how are they going to access those funds uh, and the, and actually overcome some of those community barriers that women and those groups have and try and get to that level because a lot of the issues uh, in terms of crimes antisocial behavior hidden hidden issues vulnerability terrorism all of those link back to having consenting communities including those diverse groups so just wanted to know what your opinions were on that and uh, not to any specific person but don't mind you I think one of the benefits, if I reflect on my previous experience um, working uh, to Sir Desmond and the police board, was having 19 members who had a wide range of views that helped to inform my views. But of course, I, I think you know, the formal structure is, is but one part of the equation. And I know that chiefs uh, and indeed many members of the police bodies network widely to, inform, to make sure they are fully informed so they can give those views uh, into the police service. And if I, I was to reflect back, you know, some of the most powerful and persuasive groups I met were not the official groups, they were the unofficial groups who made their way or who we made ourselves accessible to. So I think it's an onus on chiefs to make sure they are fully accessible, not just to the elected, whatever the structure is. And, and again, there may be, I think, some opportunity for seeking clarity within the uh, legislature around what the, P the structure of the PCP may be, the way in which you broaden that, uh, that, that diversity issue, which it's self-evident is not going to be uh, delivered by, by one person. And of course, we just don't police the majority. In fact, I would say most of my time was policing the minority groups and the disadvantaged groups and the disenfranchised groups who, for, for all sorts of other complex social reasons, were people who tended to come into contact with the police more than the, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of people who just get on with their lives. So it's, it's a very valid point, uh, but I do see other ways of making sure that's covered. Uh, Stephen, you, you said that there was going to be geographical representation in a force like West Mids, for instance, that covers different uh, councils. That, but, but will there be other, any other provisions around representation? Uh, yes, there will. Instead, I mean, I agree with what Hugh says in terms of it's not all about structures, but we have said that police and crime panels, although they will be predominantly drawn from uh, local councillors across the range of authorities in a force area, there will be some independence as well. Um, and, of course, the assembly of that panel should have due regard to the really important points that, that Saima makes. But the police and crime commissioner, him or herself, will also make judgments about what kind of support they need, where they want to draw on advice. That will be for them. We are not going to prescribe it in any detail. And I would expect sensible PCCs to make judgments about uh, ensuring that they are informed uh, about those kinds of issues and the kind of community issues that Saima talks about as part of how they're going to equip themselves up to do, uh, do the job. Um, much more broadly, of course, we are absolutely committed to wanting to see the most diverse range of candidates we can get for these really important jobs, uh, both in terms of ethnicity and gender, uh, but also just in terms of sheer background they come from. Mm. And we're going to do a lot more work with a range of bodies, including the Institute of Government, uh, but I hope also with the APA, uh, about how we can ensure that people are supported to come from a range of backgrounds and address some of the points that Simon makes. How is it envisaged that the independence on the PCP will be appointed? Um, I think they will go through a public appointments process relatively similar to the one uh, we have now. But, I mean, you're right, there is some detail to be done on exactly how that will work to minimise the bureaucracy that might go So there. would it be councillors first and then the independents? So the councillors will interview and appoint? Or um, I, think, I think that's still, still for debate, Kate. Right, OK. Chuck, how do you, in the States, how do you uh, bridge the divide between the usual suspects showing up for governance and the politicians being there and then the underrepresented groups? Well, I think I think uh, Hugh Hugh was right. You know, you have you know you have city councils and you have community groups, and then you have people who you know you have to deal with who are very strong. They may be minority groups, but they are very strong. And an effective police chief figures out how to deal with all of those constituencies. And the fact that there may be more of one group than the other really is irrelevant because you find out many of the, the minority groups are, are the ones uh, who feel are most impacted by what the police do, one way or the other. So I think the you know, effective uh, chief executive deals with a, a range of, of groups and, 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 and has an open door policy and uses their district commanders to help them understand it, but also has a way that people can see them uh, at any time. I'm, there, are, there, are, there are police chiefs in the United States that literally give out their cell phone number to, to 100 different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100 different people seem to have mine. Uh, Blair, <laughs> did you want to say something? Yeah. I'd just say one thing. Um, we don't, we don't know yet who will come forward to be candidates for police and crime commissioners. Um, I think it's a good prediction to say that we'll have quite a uh, varied group of people. They, they, they probably won't all be uh, white, middle-aged um, men. Um, and I think it depends 
to some extent, on what the political parties themselves do by way of choosing their candidates. Political parties will be heavily involved in these elections. Um, the House of Commons now is much more diverse than, than it's ever been, um, partly to some extent helped by innovations like uh, open primary processes for, for selection as, as party candidates. If those sort of mechanisms are brought to bear as well with the selection for candidates for police and crime com commissioners, be it Labour, Lib Dem, Conservative, then um, I see no reason why there couldn't be a very diverse mix of people standing. Including presumably retired chiefs who might well decide to um, <laughs> just stand here at the front. <laughs>